for being here tonight because we have a great competition in this design week. There are like about 10 events every night. So thanks for being here and choosing us. In the mid-century years, Danish modern had found its way into the millions of homes across the Western world, shaping the lifestyle of well-educated Danish middle class and the taste of Americans and British away from antiques and into the modern. Danish modern became the blockbuster of the furniture industry and the preference of the young generation during the post-war years. In its heyday, it was perceived as the ultimate combination of fine craftsmanship, honest approach to materials, simplicity, harmonious integration of form and structure, and functional, good, democratic design. Danish modern was placed on the world stage and received enormous coverage in local and international exhibitions and fairs from Copenhagen to Milan to London to New York. It was constantly featured on the covers of the finest magazines, and it was a new hot thing for all baby boomers' parents who wanted to live stylish. This evening, come to celebrate Danish modern and to illuminate on its current state and identity. This event is sponsored by Brun Rasmussen Auctioneers and will followed by a Danish style reception. So I would like to introduce the speakers from Copenhagen. Peter Kelgaard is the head of modern design at Brun Rasmussen Auctioneers. James Amite is curator and director of museum relations at r and Company, and Vance Trimble, collector, expert, and interior designer. So thanks for being here, and we're going to start. Peter, I want to ask you first, what are the characters and values of Danish modern? Um, if I should make one characteristic about uh, Danish design, I would say it's about craftsmanship. Um, this is what makes it stand out in comparison to, to most other uh, design movements of the same era. Um, there was a guy in, in Denmark, there's a curator at the Design Museum, he made a very good sort of illustration of that. He said, if American design is about business and German design is about science and Italian design is about art, then Danish design is exactly about craftsmanship. So that is the defining character, in my view, of, of, of this character, uh, of Danish design. Vance, you are creating interiors, and we see here two of them, and you have been known to use the finest examples of Danish modern. What type of values do they, these pieces bring to the interior space today? When I approach an interior design project, I, um, I always think about the mix of uh, objects I can use in furniture, and I find that the historical Danish furniture always adds something uh, to the room that I can't achieve by buying uh, new pieces. It's, uh, it has this very unique quality of being historical, being modern, and being extremely well made all at the same time. And, uh, it really, in, particularly in the area of seating, I think just is unmatched in um, it, its presence, its comfort, its quality. James, you are an expert in mid-century, and I want to ask you about America. The mid-century years were particularly rich in development in American design and with many exhibitions, and yet Americans were crazy about Danish design in the mid-century. Why? Well, the Museum of Modern Art what played a huge role, of course, in promoting Danish design in that they started to, in the 1940s, include Danish designers like Finn Juhl and Hans Wegner in the various kind of competitions and, and exhibitions that were this good design concept that was about you know, promoting a modern outlook, um, but also affordable and you know, something that could easily be, you know, obtainable as well in terms of purchasing these pieces from department stores and things like that. And so 
one of the things that's always been fascinating to me is that obviously America has this rich history of collecting Danish design from the very moment that these pieces were first released and first exported here. And so, you know, I've been to so many different interiors where I would go on a house call when I was at Sotheby's and I'd, I'd get there ostensibly to see American mid-century furniture, to see either American studio furniture by Nakashima or by Wendell Castle or by Paul Evans, or to see American mid-century modern furniture by Eames, by Saarinen, by Nelson, by Noguchi. Peter, Danish modern had its moment in the 50s, but then it faded uh, completely. When did you start uh, recognizing its comeback? Well, my background is actually that I was uh, studying political science, and I was starting to get interest in, in this um, mid-century period back in the 90s when, when there was really no one that was interested in it, in Denmark at least. So I would go around and I would see great Hans Wegner pieces or other uh, great designers, and you could buy them for if not pennies, then a few dollars. So this was mid-90s, um, and that was the first time that I sort of sensed that there were some people that were starting to take a real interest in this. There was a growing market for it, and uh, then it sort of expanded ever since that. So uh, mid-90s. Mid uh, were you one of these dealers? <laughs> Is this the one you refer to? <laughs> Okay. There's a few dealers in the audience, actually. <laughs> Some really important ones, actually, <laughs> going way back to that period. Um, yeah. That's a huge <laughs> honor. It was called the Pace Setter House Program, and it was initiated by, by the house beautiful, legendary editor, Elizabeth Gordon, he tried to introduce a new way of living modern in post-war America, but unlike the case study house program, it was something that actually criticized orthodox modernism and offered livable spaces for Americans, and Danish modern, as well as Frank Lloyd Wright, were the stars. So Vance, I want to ask you, why did Danish modern fell out of favor? It was so popular in the 50s and 60s here. It became super popular. Everyone had to have it. And I think partly um, it suffered because of, of its popularity. And eventually, in the late 60s, you could buy it at Sears. And through catalogs, you could buy the American version of Danish modern, and I think it it uh, just sort of uh, became so popular and so watered down over the years that it imploded, and people just uh, thought it was uh, representative of sort of post-war design, and they wanted to move on to something new, and it, it collapsed and disappeared. And That's really, so it's overexposure. People yeah. got tired of it. James, you have uh, been a part of this entire uh, rediscovery of mid-century design. What, wh how do you position Danish modern, let's say in comparison to French mid-century or Italian in terms of the collectible market? I, I, think it's, I think it's really, I mean, look, in, in, in general speaking, when it comes to the secondary market for all of 20th century design, French design, certain aspects of French design are always going to be the most expensive. And that's despite the ups and downs of all the little micro markets over the years. But then once you get beyond the certain sort of like, Fran you know, Americans, and their francophilic tendencies and, and these sort of powerhouse designers through the French decades, then you know, there, I think that Danish design, American design, and Italian design are all relatively similar and on a similar plane of value in that they go up and down. Individual designers have their moments up and down. And at the same time, what the most important thing that's really happened over the past 30 years is a increase in connoisseurship, which is such an important word here, the connoisseurship amongst the auction house experts, the museum curators, the gallerists and dealers, and the collectors to recognize that 
in a market as vast as Danish design, there not only are there iconic models, but there are of course many, many different versions sometimes of the same iconic model. Connoisseurship is really important, and some people have this misconception that we, when it comes to Danish modern, there is really no connoisseurship. And I want to start with this. So Peter, let's, say, let's talk about grade A, B, and C. And let's look at these examples. The big overstuff easy chair. Uh, that would certainly be on my sort of A list of, of Danish design. It's, um, it's the Tired Man chair by Fleming Lassen, a chair that was designed in 1936 and uh, actually sort of precedes the mid century uh, thing. Um, that is today probably among the most collectible pieces of, of, of Danish design. So that would be on the A list. And at the bottom, we will have a, a great sofa by Cor Clint. That would be on my B list. It's not as such a rare piece, but uh, it's a piece that when it has the patina, the original uh, leather from Niger, goats from Niger, as in, in this uh, image, then it's, it's, it's collectible in the sense of it certainly be on a B list. And then you have a, a uh, very, very nice Paul Kerholm PK9 chair. Uh, Again, a piece that has been reduced in, in quantity, but again, if it has the right leather, light, the right patina, the right appearance, then it can be a, a nice collectible, a nice piece to buy, not at a huge sum of money, but, but certainly collectible. A lot of people, like my clients, really love that chair. Everybody loves that chair. <laughs> Raise your hand. Who doesn't want to have that chair? Well, oh, I say, who doesn't want to have that chair? <laughs> OK, so we have four examples here. Can you say something about them? Yes. Um, so this is maybe for, uh, for some of you, uh, basically the same chair. But it's, it's actually uh, three different chairs that you see up here. At the top, we have a, a very, very nice early example of the Wigner Swivel chair. Um, the nice wooden back and the leather seat and the small um, uh, caster wheels. Um, so this would be the highly collectible. It's the original version. It's it's how it was to be how supposed to be when it was shown in the cabinet makers exhibition in the 50s, and this is the right one. So then you have uh, one with a more simple uh, base. Um, that is a later version from the original maker, cabinet maker Johannes Hansen. This is from late 60s uh, into the 70s. And this is completely different value. It's, 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 it's original in the sense that it's from the first original maker, but it's obviously in a different chair. And it's, it's about, at best, a third of, of the other one. Um, and then the final example is a re-edition of, uh, of the Wigner chair. It's still one of the few pieces that are made uh, by hand by P.P. Mürbler, which has taken up the tradition of, uh, of uh, the handmade Wigner furniture. But it's a chair that you can buy today. And as such, it is, it's not uh, collectible in the sense of the first one. In terms of uh, auction prices, I would say that uh, the, the Wigner chair, the first one we could fetch is an example like this, which fetch something like maybe Twenty to thirty thousand dollars. That would be the sort of range that I would I would see it in, in Denmark. Um, the other version with this more simple base would be uh, around uh, something like uh, eight to ten thousand dollars. And the last one would be if it came up, uh, if, if something yeah. like what four or five thousand. James, uh, this is my surprise to you. Um, let's talk about Pedermos. Peter Moos is, is a Danish um, you know, maker, is I guess the word I would use, a true blue cabinet maker, who is the, is, he is the closest, I think, that the Danes have to the American studio tradition of Nakashima, Castle, Eshrick, et cetera, in that he was truly making one-off works for you know, his clients and his patrons, and it, there was not a sense of real mass production for the vast majority of his designs. And so you're not going to find Petter Moose in American interiors. Petter Moose has become a wildly popular and highly collected designer with all the big records mostly being set at Brun Rasmussen. I had a couple pieces at Sotheby's, but you're finding it in Copenhagen. 
you're not finding it in a living room in you know you know the Chicago suburb or something like that. Yeah, he, he had his he has his workshop in in the central Copenhagen and it was up under the roof, and he he made a construction where he had a bed that he could slide out on the roof, so he was was lying up there looking into the stars at night. Even in winter, <laughs> even in the winters. He, I don't know, I, maybe so. <laughs> Um, he, he was quite a character. Um, when people ordered a piece of furniture by him, uh, they said, you said that there were three things you had to prepare for this. But you, you didn't know when it was going to be finished, and you didn't know what it was going to look like, and you didn't know how much it was going to cost. <laughs> However, on the last point, you could be pretty certain that it was going to be very expensive, and more than you initially agreed for. Okay, so talking about consortship, uh, Vance, you have recently uh, co-curated a show at our company on Ole Venture. Um, how, how did you get to have this expertise? Venture was um, from an sort of art historical family. He was very well read. He did a lot of research on even ancient furniture and wrote books on it long before he became known as a designer. But when he did design, he found uh, historical models, whether they be Egyptian, Chinese, or English, and he really uh, transformed them and stripped them down to their very basics. And uh, he had a strong collaboration with uh, a couple of the best uh, cabinet makers in Copenhagen. If we talk maybe about the one single piece of furniture of Danish modern that is so much praised, it's the chieftain chair. Uh, the, the chieftain chair is, is, is probably, as you say, the flagship of sort of Danish modern, uh, designed in 1949 and, and shown at the Copenhagen Cabinet Makers Guild exhibition that year. Um, the Danish king came by and he sat in it and then a reporter asked, uh, Finn, should, should it now be called the king's chair? And he said, no, it should be yeah, it called the chieftain's chair. Uh, he was very inspired by uh, Africana, Finn Um In my view, it's, 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 it's a very un-Danish chair in the sense that it's so huge. It's, 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 um, it's not common for Danish pieces of furniture to, to be so... Uh, potent and big and make such a strong um, impression in my view. Um, the chair uh, has been produced ever since it was uh, designed in 1949. So very, very powerful and uh, different than any other piece of Danish modern furniture that we know in terms of the design. But can you say something about connoisseurship? It's a very good uh, example of connoisseurship here. Um, the new pieces you generally want to have from the original cabinet maker, who's called Nils Walter. And he was the one who made Fignol pieces from 1937 and up until they parted in 1960, 59, I think it was. Is it stamped? That's the question I get again and again. Is it stamped? Is it stamped? And they want to have this stamp uh, from cabinet maker Nils Walter on the piece. Actually, that in, in itself, is only something you put on when you started exporting the pieces to the United States. So it's not a sign of uh, authenticity as such. Uh, but it, it, if you can, it's better that it's there. James, you have recently placed this chair in, a, in an American museum collection. Again, it goes back to when Peter was talking about the history of Finn Ewell's chieftain chair and all of the varying cabinet makers. America has actually received almost one from all of them over the years in that there were um, original examples that were exported to the United States in the early 1950s. This particular one is from that early, early group uh, that was built by Niels Vader and was sold at, this particular one was sold at George Jensen at the store in New York. But now this is in the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh. And I just want to say one quick thing. It's kind of fascinating. American museums are really, really, really behind the eight ball when it comes to collecting Danish design. I want a couple of words on new directions in collecting Danish modern today. And I have a couple of examples, if you can elaborate on them. And James, you too. 
Yeah, well, let's start out with something completely on Danish. <laughs> um, uh, if you wonder where Restoration Hardware got their inspiration from, then you can probably look at this piece. <laughs> But this is actually Denmark um, at its most exotic uh, in 1941. Uh, this is some of the things that the market is trying to sort of pick up on on the moment. They want to have something that is unknown, that is before sort of Danish modern was established. And then we find pieces like this. So this is a, a, something I couldn't, it, it mostly looked like a French piece from the 1940s. and and. And that's actually also where it went when we sold it. <laughs> uh, but but it's, um, it's, 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 it's just a reminder that even though we talk about uh, Danish modern as, as a style, as, there are always exceptions. There are always things that are very different. And, and this is one of them. Yeah, yeah this is uh, Fleming Lesson, the guy with the tired man, the chair that we saw a little while ago. He designed this sofa in 1935. And again, this is what today is on the A-list of, of Danish modern. Um, uh, we sold, we'd never seen it. Uh, then this one came out, and we fetched a very good price for that. And then a few others came out. But probably just a handful have been made of these uh, pieces back in the 1930s. Yeah, I mean, at the beginning of the market, at auction, starting in the late 1990s, it wasn't something you would ever see, you know, because people had no idea what it was at that point. So, I mean, that's the thing. Now that the decades have gone by, they've found, you know, everyone's expertise is much higher. So now people understand what it is. And I want, before we taking a couple of questions from the audience, uh, I would like to uh, just say something about Bruno Rasmussen. Uh, one of the things that I found amazing, James, I don't know if you know that, that when you buy a piece from them, they actually have containers. C can you say something about that? Are, are you aware of that? Oh, I'm very aware of it. It's, a, it's, it's, it's kind of, it, it's amazing because um, our galleries bought a few pieces from Bruin Rasmussen and, and, and yeah, their shipping procedures are like remarkable compared to like some of the piece in Christie's in terms so, of like, so so you the buy deal, a piece of yeah. furniture and you pay like two hundred dollars to ship it to New York. Yeah. It's amazing. So that amazingly valuable as well as the fact that they get an access you guys get an access to very original homes. And, and how does this really happen? Because I know that Danish people really like to hold on of their furniture, of their parents' furniture. So when do they get to sell that? Well, I mean, um, occasionally people have to move and they split up or someone dies. And then we uh, are often asked to, to come out. And we are still very, very lucky that we are sort of the going into the sort of first owners of many of these things. So it's, 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 it's sometimes. I'm going into home and they have these pieces from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and they come to us and, and they sell them. And so um, you have a representation here in, uh, in New York, and uh, that makes it, and this is Sandra, yeah. who is the representative. So I would like to take a couple of questions from the audience. Um, a, any question? So let's start here, John. Uh, just out of curiosity, if you, if, do you have any idea of your sale, of your typical sale? What uh, what percentage stays in Denmark or in Europe versus what comes to the United States? Okay. <laughs> the percentage that stays in Denmark is is probably around two percent. So it's all leaving Denmark. The Danes are to some extent blind of their own inheritance. They're, it's it's so much around them that they don't to some extent notice it. So, uh, so, and that's going back to where I said in, in the beginning, a lot of it goes to New York. I would say um, uh, about 30% of, of all our pieces uh, are going to the States. Uh, then there were a lot of clients in, in Japan, to some extent China, um, and, uh, and then rest of Europe. So it's, it's all leaving Denmark, and, and one day we will maybe be left only with IKEA. <laughs> <laughs> OK, more questions? Uh, Eric. 
Yeah, hi. Uh, who would you say is the new generation of people that might be making collectible Scandinavian design now that we should keep our eyes on in the next 50 years? Um, I'm sometimes asked that question, and, and maybe I'm too focused on the past. But, but going back to where I said uh, early on, I look at this period in, Den in, in, in history in Denmark as, as one of the few times where we were, if not the best to do something, certainly among the best. Um, uh, the other period probably being shipbuilding in the age of the Vikings. Um, so honestly, I don't think there is, is, is going to be a new golden age of Danish design as such. I think that, that, that the designers today in Denmark are uh, obviously uh, educated with this craftsmanship tradition, but the marketplace is more global and, and they sort of mix with uh, manufacturers uh, around the world. So you don't have this symbiotic relationship with the, with the designer and maker that in my view has been one of the uh, forces behind it. Thank you. So we're gonna take the last question. Well, I just wanna mention that uh, if somebody buys finial and, uh, and it's really wanna buy some good examples, that they need to be very careful because there was a production in America of, uh, of finial that uh, was made by Baker. Absolutely, and, 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 you're, and a man who really knows what he's doing too out there in the audience, who, who has seen it all. The, um, yeah, the Baker, the Baker furniture, uh, Finn Yule was, you know, he took the dramatic step of signing a contract with Baker, which was in Grand Rapids, right? I think Michigan. And you do see the chieftain chair made by Baker in the 1950s. In fact, the drawings of it are in the Cooper Hewitt uh, National Design Museum, as along with the you know, model number 45 and a couple of the other ones as well. A distinctly lower value range, yes. So I'd like to uh, thank you all for being here. And I want to thank our amazing speakers, Peter, James, and Vance, and to... And, and to Brun Rasmussen, and let's have some drinks. Thank you. Mm -hmm.